Well, thank you so much for attending a significant side event titled Addressing Global Water Challenges for Sustainable Development Through Private Action and Nuclear Disarmament in the Pacific. So this event is sponsored by the mission of Kiribati, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, its youth initiative, Reverse the Trend, Save Our People, Save Our Planet, Earth Echo International, Blue Planet Alliance, the Marshallese Educational Initiative, and the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Today, we'll hear from an array of distinguished panelists about the twin existential threats of climate change and the legacy of nuclear weapons in the Pacific. We will first hear from two distinguished ambassadors, one from Kiribati, one from the Marshall Islands, both states which have been impacted by nuclear weapons and rising sea levels. Kiribati experienced 33 nuclear tests from the United Kingdom and the U.S., while the Marshall Islands experienced 67 nuclear tests from the United States. Both states are striving for a safe and resilient world, a world free of nuclear weapons, and one where climate change is mitigated. Without further ado, I would like to um, invite His Excellency Ambassador Tibero Sito, the permanent representative of Kiribati, to share some brief remarks. Ambassador Sito is currently the ambassador to the United Nations, the United States, and also the Kiribati ambassador to Mexico and Canada. So I would like to invite him. Would you like to come up to the podium, or would you like to? What would be your preference? Whatever, whatever you desire. Yes. Good morning, welcome. So thank you to the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in its youth initiative, Reverse the Trend, Save Our People, Save Our Planet, Earth Echo International, Blue Planet Alliance, there are a lot of people here, <laughs> Marshall East Educational Initiative, and the Sustainable Ocean Alliance for co-sponsoring this timely event for the Water Conference with us. And thank you all for showing up, making time to attend this uh, side event. And uh, I must say, in Kiribati to start off with, Kamna Maori. Maori means all feel good because you're, you're safe. All the spiritual world are with you, with you now. Mainly from Kiribati, because they listen to the word Maori, they all jump in and embrace all of you, right? I don't know about the New York spirits, because I have a problem. I said that the Marshallese spirits are here too, because when we talk in Kiribati, the Marshallese can hear what we say. So I believe that Marshallese and, and Kiribati spirits, good spirits, are here with us, and they're embracing all of you and making you feel good today. Mm -hmm. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for your time. Can start sharing ideas. Looks like we are in trouble. Uh, Marshalls, Kiribati, and the low lying atolls, and especially those who have been impacted by forces which are beyond us, like nuclear, nuclear tests, like climate change. We don't want, we know, we know, two parts in the making of nuclear test. They just say we're coming. Good for you mankind. You better better say yes because it's good for you and for all of us and for the whole world. Why not accept such a grand idea to help mankind? We all want to help mankind, we want to help the world. But when the world is finished, then we're all finished. So that's the island way of looking at things. And when we receive suggestions or ideas from our great friends who are more powerful, they, they've studied the planet much more than us. They come with ideas, we, say, we tend to say, yes, good, you're welcome. But then sometimes things don't to work out the way we were told. And so this is why I guess we have a discussion like this. So thank you, Christian, for organizing this. Thank you all the partners. Uh, I was told that uh, Kiribati is sponsoring this, but I, I did not hear anybody asking me for a check. To, 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 to pay for that, I'd show who's paying for it. 
<laughs> you are, okay? <laughs> Keep bringing my kid's name to it. One time we'll bring a big tuna fish and put it in. Put it in. <laughs> but there's no doubt that the Pacific region is experiencing the most significant changes in sea levels and climate extremes. So much so that even on a marginal, in, even a marginal increase in sea level rise places our islands and coastal communities at immediate risk. In Kibas, sea level rise, extreme weather events, increase in annual and seasonal temperatures, and changes in precipitation patterns are some of the impacts of climate change that have already been observed and felt by the people. No part of Kibas land rises more than two meters above the ocean making it one of the most vulnerable places in the world to the sea level rise being driven by global heating. Several small islands have already been inundated by water with parts of others eroded by the advancing tides. Intruding salt water threatens the ability to grow crops and risks the fresh brown water that sits upon the porous reefs that form the basis of the islands. So, I look forward to a very uh, fruitful, productive interaction, discussion, interaction, and to the uh, state force, to the statements to be uh, delivered by my honorable colleague from Marshall Island, Ambassador Madeleine. And uh, and uh, the our distinguished speaker here, uh, Benedict, which has been around and been telling the world the plight of the low lying atolls like uh, Marshall Kilibas, Tuvalu, I think, so Kerala in the Pacific. And we can say Maldives in the Indian Ocean, they also part of the same plight. So, for those of you who well, thank you, Christian, and again, we can give back. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sito. Next, we will hear from Ambassador Amatalain Kabua, the permanent representative of the Marshall Islands to the United Nations. Well, in Tilbury, they come in Maori, and in the Marshall, we say Yahweh. Yeah, and what I mean, I love you, you are the rainbow. No, you are rainbow. Yeah. Um, Excellency, uh, President and PR Tito from Kiribati, my young youth here from the Marshall Island as well, Benedict, we are going to be my nephew. And he's been championing uh, the MEI, the Marshall Island Education Institute, is that it? In Arkansas, it's based in Arkansas. He's been here for some time and working alongside uh, Kristen. Um, thank you, Kristen, for this opportunity to share with you, you know, on this uh, water topic and also a little bit of our, you know, um, experience with our nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. So as we consider World Water Day, it is important that as a multilateral undertaking, we do more than identify problems, but also work towards practical solutions with impact at ground level in local communities. In the Republic of the Marshall Islands, we lack safe and effective access to drinking water in our population centers. Our remote our islands are even more vulnerable. Periods of drought create severe risk especially for our remote outer islands communities. In population centers, we lack fully functional delivery system. Our primary water supply in Majuro, our capital city, is our rainwater, is rainwater from our air, airport runway. On the side of our international airport in the capital, we have like water catchment. So when it rains, it catches on the side of the, of the airport and then they uh, pump it to the uh, reservoir. 
um, that was built some time ago with the help of Japan um, government. And they treated before they bump it up to um, send it to the city. And it, we're still on water hours from the, you know, from day to day. So with development partner, we can see improved um, basic infrastructure, infrastructure in site. But there has been a measure of progress, including in disaster management and outer island water security with plans for more. However, we are also realizing climate-driven acceleration of salt water, intrusion of our thin freshwater lands, and greater weather variability. And for our low-lying atoll state, as mentioned by my colleague, Ambassador Tito, the future projections are much worse. Perhaps what is most important is that we are not being passive victims, but we have an active and vital voice in working towards resilience, even in difficult challenges. Our legacy and contemporary struggle address nuclear testing. Impact is also relevant. As a result of 80, I mean 67 atmospheric nuclear weapon tests during our time as a UN trusteeship uh, administered by the US from 1946 to 1958. This is not just a historical issue, but one which affects us as, as now, and which affects our human rights. We lack an effective national architecture. We don't have scientific, technical, and lab capacity to tell ourselves what is safe and what is not. Only in the past few years was a national nuclear committee formed to provide some measure of coordination but we don't have our own experts. We are left relying on foreign scientists, as we have for decades. And science itself seems a moving goalpost, and past assessment of safety are revised. This also produce, produces a local caution or mistrust of basic island staples, our food, our fish, in our crops and imported canned food has only led our nation into a serious public health crisis with one of the highest diabetes incidents rate in the world. Closely affected local communities are still fighting and negotiating for unmet compensation, a claim awarded by a judicial process made decades ago and not met by the U.S. These are marked, marked challenges. But not without hope. And again, we as Marshallese must play a vital role. We have long served as a focal advocate at the UN for any measure of effective and meaningful reduction of nuclear risk. And it is not impossible that we gain greater international support. At the UN Human Rights Council, as a result of a resolution about this testing, there is now UN system support to improve national human rights capacity regarding testing impacts. The new UN multi-country office in FSM, which now cover the Micronesian territories. You know, these are the smaller, that's why we're called micro, because we're the five states that are small, as Kiribati, Nauru, uh, Palau, Micronesia, federally the state of Micronesia, and Marshall Island, these five of us. So we have now a UN direct you know, person that now take care of that region. But it took over 15 years to fight for this in the UN system to have a closer connection to the UN and where we can get help. So this, the new UN multi-country office is in FSM. We serve the Pacific North, including RMI. It's also a key opportunity to expand UN support in other nuclear testing impact areas, including scientific and public health capacity so we can test for ourselves our own water and best understand our own resources as well as threats and impacts which remain after 75 years. We cannot be silent or passive victim, even for something we did not cause. We have to have active ownership of our future because to do otherwise, just to extend the devastation further, 
and not to stand up to its justice. Thank you so much. And for more than it's nice to see young people here today. Thank you for your presence today. You know, you're the future of this world. I hope by your generation, you will bring better solution for this troubled world. So, all my very best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Master Kabula. Um, next, we will have a special guest, Benedict Kabula Manager. Benedict is the Executive Director of the Marshall News Educational Initiative. Um, which is a nonprofit in Arkansas where the highest concentration of Marshallese reside in the continental United States. He was born in the Monroe Plateau. Madison migrated to the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas with his family at the age of six. His work at MEI includes raising the education movement levels of Marshallese residents. He regularly speaks about the ongoing consequences of his legacy. In climate change on his homelands at conferences and events in the U.S. and internationally. Benedict is also an Arkansas State University student pursuing a political science degree. He is the project lead for the Youth for a Nuclear Justice Project funded by the Plowshares Fund, and he's also an advisor for RTT. He's the floor is yours. I'm going to ask also if one of our um, RTT youth could help with these slides, please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Yahweh, good afternoon. Um, I wish to thank all of the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you all today. As always, it is an honor to represent my people's voices in these spaces, especially on two critical issues that are no strangers to the Marshall Islands and its people, the nuclear and climate nexus. I was born in the Marshall Islands and lived there until age six. Our people have rich cultural traditions tied to our lands, the ocean, and the sky. Next slide, please. Before our island chains were designated the Marshall Islands by a British sea captain, for millennia, the islands and atolls were called Aidangainai, which means these atolls of ours. I is the word for ocean currents, in this case, the ocean. Lung means above, the sky, or the heavens. Gain is the word for these, but it is also the root word for kainakan, or vegetations, in this case, the land. It is a holistic view of the Marshallese world, the land, the ocean, and the sky. My ancestors were also caretakers of the land. They left certain islands unused so that they could be nesting grounds for, for birds, for example. When my ancestors arrived nearly 4,000 years ago, they cultivated the lands to grow crops. Those foods, along with the bounty of the ocean, provided a sustainable and healthy diet. Our people also have a strong tradition of navigation and canoe building. Outrigger canoes could transport dozens of people in long ocean trading voyages. Master navigators taught their students using a metal or stick chart pictured in the background. The chart has shells representing the different islands and atolls and the sticks representing the ocean currents. Navigators use the stars, the wind, animal sightings, and the feel of the waves to navigate around the two atoll chains that make up our islands. Although only a few know these ancient navigational skills, there are efforts today to revive that knowledge so that our people can continue to navigate the ocean. Next slide, please. As scholar Etele Uafa wrote, the ocean is a pathway, not a barrier. The Marshallese people still utilize and protect the ocean. Next slide. The Marshall Islands in the North Central Pacific, not the South Pacific, it has a combined land mass the size of Washington, D.C., and an exclusive economic zone, nearly 750 square miles. 
or the size of Mexico. Tony Dubrun, the late climate ambassador of the Marshall Islands, used to say, the Marshall Islands is an ocean nation. To emphasize that the archipelago is not just land, it is also water. Next slide. The Marshall Islands comprise of five islands and 29 coral-shaped ring atolls that sit on top of two ancient volcanic, volcanic chains running from northwest to southwest called Radak, which means sunrise, and Radik, sunset. The country's average elevation is two meters above sea level, which puts, which puts it at risk of rising sea levels. Next slide. Um, so as you can see, the lagoon side of the land is, uh, is, is calm, and the ocean side on the right is where waves lap against the shoreline. And uh, this is actually supposed to be a footage of Maduro, our capital. Next slide. So this is Tempo Alfred on his outrigger canoe back in 2014. While searching the web for photos of fishing in the Marshall Islands for this presentation, I ran across this image. Alfred was on his own atoll of Idol when, as a 13-year-old boy, he witnessed Castle Bravo detonation. Bravo was the largest of the 67 nuclear weapons the United States detonated on my homelands between 1946 and 58. He remembered a flash of light and the sounds of the explosion and echoes that followed. While the U.S. contemplated evacuating the people of Iduk after Bravo because of the fallout on their lands, ultimately it did not remove the survivors that, that day on Iduk. According to the Marshall Islands Journal, Alfred spoke about his experience later in his life, about how he was fishing in the lagoon when Bravo occurred, and how he felt his atoll had been ignored. He died on the 2nd of March, one day after he attended Nuclear Victims Remembrance Day in Midiru, in 2018. Next slide. After World War II, the U.S. occupied the Marshall Islands and selected Bikini and Anuweta atolls for nuclear weapons testing. The first test was detonated on Bikini in July of 1946. In a span of 12 years, the United States conducted 67 large-scale nuclear weapons, resulting in ongoing biological, ecological, and cultural consequences. Next slide, please. And on March 1st, 1954, the U.S. detonated its most powerful nuclear device, Castle Bravo. It was a thousand times the force of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Nearby communities were exposed to numerous nuclear fallouts a few hours after the explosion, causing extensive damage to people's health and the environment, including the contamination of water sources. <coughs> Next slide. This photo reminds me of the flooding I experienced as a child living in Midiru, the capital of the Marshall Islands. I was about five years old, playing near the road with my friends, when suddenly out of nowhere, water came rushing from the ocean onto the land. I remember the frightening screams of men, women, and children, and I ran home to find my house was flooded. It was at waist level. I would have drowned if I had stayed in that house a little longer, <laughs> But thanks to my dad, he got me to higher grounds. My story is just one of many. Since 2014, the Marshall Islands has urged the world to keep global temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius, because 1.5 means a point of no return for my country. Despite numerous warnings, today's global temperature continues to rise, and the climate crisis, as we all know, is already here. With high temperatures, we see glaciers melting faster than scientists predicted. This is terrible news for places like the Marshalls and Kiribati, which are a few feet above sea level. Most islands are less than a mile wide, and the foundation of the Marshalls is corals, which are sensitive to rising temperatures. Marine life depends on corals, so if corals were to go extinct, there would be no fish contributing to the growing hunger around the world. Fishes are a main diet in the islands, and it would be a, it would be devastating to 
to the local population. Next slide, please. Climate change is not only about flooding and corals, however. The media often portrays Marshall Islands as disappearing. However, the impact of climate change will remove, will force the removal of my people before they technically sink. Climate change has resulted in more frequent and severe storms. Storm surge causes salt water intrusion, contaminating freshwater stores and killing crops. It has contributed to drought in the northern atolls and is the main cause of increased mosquito-borne illnesses. Next slide. Today, the Marshallese people struggle with twin existential threats, climate change, and the ongoing consequences of the nuclear testing legacy. The Rena Dome on Anahuadu stores 3.1 million cubic feet of nuclear debris from the U.S. nuclear testing program in the Marshall Islands, and this is where we connect um, the twin issues of climate and nuclear. The structure has been leaking nuclear contaminants into the oceans since it was constructed, as there is no lining under it to contain the poison inside. For us Marshallese, the ocean is our traditional refrigerator, as I like to say, and so is the land. When they are destroyed, it impacts our identity. The climate crisis, which will exacerbate the ongoing environmental, health, and cultural consequences of nuclear testing. In other words, these issues will break our traditional ties to island gay night by forced relocation and contamination. Next slide. If the world continues with business as usual and does not create a livable planet for all, this will be my homelands and people's future. Even though we contribute so little to global carbon emissions, low-lying island nations like mine will be hit the hardest. We are literally on the front line of the climate crisis, and people have told us that we should relocate but Marshley's land is central to Marshley's culture. Relocation is the last resort. Our late climate ambassador, Tony De Bruyne, who was instrumental in getting the majority of nations on board to support the climate accord um, in 2015, once said, to move us from our home is tantamount to asking us to eliminate a society from the face of the earth. We're talking about eliminating tradition, language, of our way of life. Maria, thank you. Thank you so much, Benedict, for your presentation. Very powerful. Thank you. So um, that concludes our high level um, segment for this event. And we're going to now transition to the youth panel, where you will hear from um, representatives from both um, you know, East Folk US, RCT, and representatives from our other co-sponsors as well. So I'll pass the floor to Emily. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, also Benetik, Ambassador Kabula, and Ambassador Sito. It's such a pleasure to have you here. One of the most important things about these United Nations conferences is having the multi-stakeholder approach where we involve governments and we have youth together learning about these issues as well as the private sector, civil society, NGO leaders. It's important that each and every one of us is participating in an effective way in these conferences. So thank you very much for being part of this conference and give them one more round of applause. Thank you. Once again, my name is Emily McGlone, and I work as the director of Peace Boat US, an international nonprofit organization. We also have our office here in this building on the third floor, so you're welcome to visit us anytime. We have special consultative status with the United Nations, and we're really proud today to introduce our youth leaders who are here participating in the United Nations Water Conference. You'll see here on the screen Blue Planet Alliance. I am also a global ambassador for Blue Planet Alliance, and we have many young leaders here from the organization who are also going to be sharing their stories with you. So I'd like to invite our youth panel to come on up to the front. If you'd like to bring a chair, we can sit here. Um, we're also going to be moving this computer, I think, up here to the front so we can go ahead and do the slides. Thank you very much. Right. So this youth panel is very important for us today as we have so many various organizations represented at the UN Water Conference. 
So we want to have everyone to introduce themselves, but more importantly, we also would like to have our youth leaders to moderate the panel. So if you'd like, you can have a seat on this side as well. Some of the youth leaders could join us over here. Great. And so I'd like to introduce to you all Peace Boat US uh, youth leader and representative, Molly Rosen. She has also been working in nuclear disarmament, is part of the Youth for TPNW group, as well as one of our um, interns, and also now supporting Blue Planet Alliance group coordinator. So please give Molly a round of applause for moderating this next session. So I think we're going to just kick off our youth panel right away. So we're first, thank you all again for joining us today. Um, first up, we're going to have Sarah, who is one of the Youth for SDG scholars. Um, the Youth for the SDG program is a unique experiential learning and capacity building program for young activists and scholars engaged in SDG-related initiatives from the U.S. and around the world. Today, Sarah is going to be telling you all a little bit about her experience in the program and being a scholar. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm really excited to share my Peace Boat journey with you all. Um, so yes, I'm Sarah Van Erdy, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. There's a lot of photos, so hopefully that will also help kind of visualize the beautiful things you see on Peace Boat. So I grew up um, falling in love with the ocean by climbing over it. Um, I'm a rock climber. Um, I also do mental health therapy, and for me, uh, climbing is one of the best ways for my own handling of my anxiety and stress, um, especially climate anxiety. So that's kind of my first glance at falling in love with the ocean was just the way it healed me. Um, and that's been something that I've been wanting to try to give back to the ocean ever since. Um, and so a part of the way that I found Peace Boat was I was getting my master's in social work and I actually got to um, work in Argentina for a couple of months. And I was working in an orphanage, um, doing some socio-emotional health work with a young, amazing kid there. Um, and then in the next slide, you can see that we actually put an art exhibit up um, that kind of showcased the students and um, gave them a chance to also just tell their story. And while in Argentina, I, could, I couldn't not go to Patagonia. Um, so this is me doing an ice glacier hike um, in El Calafate. And truly just, again, beautiful seeing the glaciers up close. Um, I think seeing things um, is a really important part of kind of having the experience to understand that they are in fact in danger. Um, so just kind of being up close and personal. Back in New York, I started a job at Global Kids, which is a partner of Peace Boat. And I was there for five years. Um, we did a lot of amazing work with youth activism. So these photos are actually from a um, protest that we uh, had gone on uh, with students and we hiked over the Brooklyn Bridge we protested the Williams Pipeline, which was going to put frack gas, um, harming wildlife. Um, there's always the fear of leaks. So we were really trying to have this permit be denied. And actually, this was successful. We were actually able to get the permit denied. Um, of course, the, you know, the National Transmission Company has asked for a two-year permit, so we might have to show up again in a couple of years. Um, but it was just showing how grassroots can really have an impact. There was, I think, 700 people there that day. Um, yes, okay, so this brings us to February 2019. Um, I had the honor of being awarded the Youth for the SDG Scholarship, and I got to go on board. We met in El Fin del Mundo, Ushuaia, Argentina, the end of the earth, and we sailed to Valparaiso, Chile. Um, and these are the scholars. So we had people from Mexico, Chile, um, San Martin, and, you know, New York City. Um, and these are some of the views that we were able to see on board. This is going through the Patagonian fjords. And again, talking to local people in Ushuaia about how the glaciers have, in their lifetime, receded um, and in such, a, in such an obvious way. And so I think, again, that if some, some things you need to kind of see to understand um, and get even more passionate about. So I think experiential learning is one of the best kind of strengths of Peace Boat. We also campaigned to have the Chilean side of Patagonia become a World Heritage Site, which would offer um, even more protection for Patagonia on that side. And that was a really cool way to get people on board Peace Boat to just like, you know, be interested in the issues that we were talking about. We got to meet the captain, we got to look through the binoculars, see how impressive it was to make this ship do what it was doing and keep us all safe as we kind of sailed to Valparaiso. 
And we had fun along the way. We got to present, we got to talk to passengers on the ship. Um, and there's a Club Bahia, which was a karaoke lounge, which was so fun. Um, even if you didn't speak the same language as someone, you could absolutely sing with them. And when we landed in Valparaiso, we actually had a chance to uh, teach people, local people, the ability to make um, solar-powered lights. And then we actually put them in um, one community in Valparaiso. And that was amazing. It was uh, an organization called Leader of Light. Um, and this is also uh, one of the survivors of Hiroshima. And she gave an amazing speech and workshop for us on board as well. This is us showing how to kind of put the solar-powered batteries together and um, installing the lights uh, in the community that we did so. Uh, then we went to Santiago and we got to talk at CEPOL, the Economic Commission for Latin America. And I was talking about gender equality and good health and well-being, um, talking a lot about how mental health for me means like, yes, healing one person on the inside, but healing the world. And this was talking at the community on um, teaching about the United Nations uh, about this similar experience. And that was also a life-changing uh, moment for me to just meet other people that were just as passionate. OK, and then this is uh, my, my way of ending by saying that anyone can be involved in this. Um, I love singing. I love art. I love poetry. So one of the things I did when I was very upset about the way that you know, the climate crisis was worsening was I wrote a poem with all 17 SDGs in it. Um, so I'll just end by giving you this little chunk of it, which has to do with today. I see a world that is focused on healing, healing our planet, our animals, ourselves, and each other. A world where we remember we belong to the earth, that we still cry the ocean's language, that we were life below water. I see a world that is blue from the ocean regaining the color in her cheeks, her coral coming back to life, her lungs free of plastic, her fish flourishing, her dolphins roaming free. She is there for us to believe in, to dance amidst her swaying tide. She has everything to teach us about patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, up next, we'll hear from Amelia, who is with Earth Echo International. This organization collaborates with youth from, from around the world to provide knowledge and develop tools that drive meaningful environmental action to protect and restore our ocean planet. Reaching more than 2 million people in 146 countries, Earth Echo International supports the next generation to become environmental leaders who will transform the future. So, take it away, Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Amelia, and I'm here representing Earth Echo. So, next slide, please. Um, so, Earth Echo's mission is to build a global youth movement to protect and restore our ocean planet. And so this is done primarily through programs that direct, like directly engage with youth, um, but also through programs that um, engage teachers and educators. Um, and one of our key understandings at Earth Echo is that ocean action and climate action are inherently connected. So for example, through restoring wetlands or mangrove forests, you're um, purifying water and buffering the coastline against sea level rise. And so ocean-based climate solutions are kind of the key to moving forward. And we've done a lot of advocacy around that. So next slide, please. Um, so a brief intro on myself and how I got involved with Earth Echo. Um, I'm 19 years old, and I got involved with Earth Echo when I was 14, when I was testing water in my freshman year of high school. Um, and that really inspired me to get involved in climate action in my local community. So I started a group called the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit. Um, there's some pictures here. Uh, and we've run an annual summit for local youth that has workshops and climate action planning um, every year since 2020. So there's been uh, three of them now. So this is our 2021 summit um, on the bottom right there. Um, and through my climate action work, I think I recognize the importance of connecting with this broader community of youth who are doing similar things in different places. Um, so that led me to apply for Earth Echo's Youth Leadership Council um, that I now serve on with around 25 other youth from across the globe. So one of the campaigns um, at Earth Echo that the Youth Leadership Council has worked on has been this Ocean Echo 30 by 30 initiative. Um, and so this initiative has three key pillars. The first is um, restoration, the second is advocacy, the third is education. I did not do those in order. 
Um, and uh, one of the big parts of this program has also been the 30 by 30 fellowship. Um, so there's been two years um, of fellows. The first year there were 10 fellows from eight different countries um, leading advocacy and education campaigns and mobilizing support for 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of the ocean by 30. 30. 2030 um, in their countries, um, and so that happened in um, Brazil, in India, um, and then the second year was more targeted in the U.S. Um, and U.S. territories um, around specific um, designation of like certain MPAs. All right, so the first pillar is that I'm going to talk about is policy and advocacy. Um, so one big piece of this is getting youth in the room for conferences like this one. Um, we were at the Our Ocean Conference. Um, also, there's some uh, Impact 5 a month ago. Um, we were at um, the COP15. Uh, and then, sorry. And then as part of this, um, engaging with policy and decision makers. So this for us has included, we've had lots of conversations with NOAA, um, the White House CEQ, um, and NOAA is actually now formalizing a youth engagement process, um, in part because of a lot of the advocacy we've done around that. Um, and then the second part of this is education. And so I'll just briefly talk about every year there's a virtual youth leadership summit that, oh, um, unites hundreds of youth from around the country and they get to network and meet um, other like-minded youth and learn from experts in different workshops. And the final uh, pillar of the 30 by 30 initiative is restoration. And so at Earth Echo we have a belief that instead of inspiration leading to action, that action actually leads to awareness. So by engaging lots of young people and community members um, in these restoration events, um, our hope and goal is that then they will have more awareness of and connection to their local environments. Oh, wait, sorry. One more <laughs> point on the last slide is at... Oh, sorry, one slide before. Oh, you got a preview. Um, is that at um, Our Ocean in Panama, we announced an externship program. Um, so that's going to bring together 25 youth of color for a regenerative ocean aquaculture externship. Um, and so that'll be 10 weeks and then culminate in an in-person visit to an aquaculture facility. And it's, the goal is to build um, or to inspire young people, particularly young people who have been really underrepresented um, and like marginalized in this environmental and ocean space and train them in sustainable careers that we know are going to have to happen for us to move towards um, ocean and climate action. Okay. Um, and so we have kind of housed all of these things and have brought them all together in an online platform called Gen C. So this is a brief look into what, if you were on Gen C, it might look like. Um, and so Gen C is the space of um, extended opportunities and connection for lots of different youth working in this ocean advocacy space. So next slide, please. So if you are under 25, you can actually join Gen Z. Um, and there's a couple ways to engage with Gen Z. So obviously, if you're in the age range, 13 to 25, you can join um, and start connecting with other youth. These conferences are great opportunities to meet other like-minded youth. And Gen Z is kind of a year-round way of connecting with these other folks. Um, and then the second way you can get involved with Gen Z, sorry, um, is if you are a nonprofit organization that works with youth um, or that wants to connect youth to the broader um, youth ocean advocacy movement, um, we'd love you to offer Gen Z as a resource for your young people. And then the third and final way is if you have opportunities that you would, for young people that you'd like to share on Gen Z, um, you're welcome to contact us and we will post them or just talk to us afterwards. 
All right, um, that is it. If you have other questions or just want to chat about Rebecca, you can talk to me or Stacy or Ella um, <laughs> afterward. And thank you so much. Up next, we have Nuria, um, who is a Peace Vote U.S. Youth Representative. Peace Vote U.S. is a committed campaigner for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, with a particular focus on ocean and climate, youth engagement, and disarmament. Peace Vote U.S. utilizes advocacy, partnerships, and education in working to achieve progress in these areas. Hi, everyone. My name is Nuria Stakowski, and I'm from Munich, Germany. And I've been interning with Peace Boat US since last September. And I wanted to share some of my experiences. First of all, I was able to learn a lot about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and also how NGOs are interwoven within the UN. But now I want to talk about Peace Boat. Peace Boat US was founded in 2006. And Peace Boat US has a parent organization. It's the Japan-based NGO Peace Boat. And they hold a special consultative status, the ECOSOC, with the United Nations. Peace Boat is a committed campaigner to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and it has an emphasis on ocean and climate, as well as youth engagement and disarmament. We are located here. Our office in the, is in the UN Plaza, just like across from the UN in the third floor. Now I want to talk about the voyages and the ship because Peace Boat mainly carries out its activities through a passenger ship. And the voyages blend sustainable tourism along with educational programs and projects. And there's three global voyages and two East Asia regional voyages happening every year. And this year we have the 114th voyage. It's the main voyage because we're sailing with our new ship it's the Pacific world, and it's also the first global voyage that Peace Boat is sailing for the UN Decade of Ocean Science and for Sustainable Development. And along with that, we are launching the Youth for the SDG Scholarship, and it's a very exciting scholarship because it's designed for young leaders aged 18 to 30, and each program is about two weeks in length, and they're going to visit or they're going to be able to visit three to five countries. And the aim is really to increase the knowledge about the UN Ocean Decade, as well as to understand how to contribute to a global call to action. We have two segments of the scholarship. There's either the Arctic route starting in London, England, then going to Norway and then to Iceland, or the second, that's the Latin America route, where we're going to go from Panama to Guatemala and then to Mexico. The last project I want to talk about is the EcoShip. The EcoShip is a transformational project and it's the construction of an environmentally friendly and sustainable cruise ship, which is going to lead to a 40% cut of CO2 emissions. And this is really a big, huge project and exciting project that Peace Boat has been working on. So stay excited, sign up, and join us on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. OK, so our next speaker will be Muna. Um, uh, and she's from Blue Planet Alliance. Um, established in 2020, Blue Planet Alliance is an organization whose mission is to protect life on Earth. Hello? Okay. Uh, is to protect life on Earth um, by empowering people, communities, islands, and nations to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. This past year, uh, Blue Planet Alliance achieved this commitment with two nations, Tonga and Tuvalu. In addition to this, they have a global ambassador program that is dedicated to building a network of young advocates engaging in global activism to make their communities and the world as a whole a better place. Now we'll be hearing um, about Moon's experience of being a global ambassador of Blue Planet Alliance. Hello everyone, my name is Muna Faruqi and I'm a 15-year-old student attending Sansa High School right here in New York City. I'm beyond thrilled to be joining all today at the 2023 UN Water Conference as a Blue Planet Alliance Global Youth Ambassador. 
And to give some context about myself, I want to speak about how since childhood, I've always been passionate about the environment and the climate. However, since I live in New York City, where my day-to-day -day life is filled with brick buildings and towers made of glass and concrete, nature is often like overcast. And so the two ways in which I want to express my appreciation for nature is not only through photography, but also through painting. And I've, for the past two years, I've been working on landscape paintings. And these two are part of a small collection that I painted recently that's exhibited, that will be exhibited at my school. And I wanted to express the inherent connections that we as humans share with nature. And so now, as I grow older and I'm entering high school, and now that I'm learning about the adversities facing our climate or environment, I want to, I wanted to um, take a more active role in climate action. And one way of doing so was joining Blue Planet Alliance. And basically, Blue Planet Alliance, our main goal is to establish, establish this legislative mandate on reaching 100% renewable energy by 2045. And as before mentioned, um, the Kingdom of Tonga, Tuvalu, and also Hawaii have established this mandate in their countries. And moving forward, Blue Planet Alliance also places this heavy emphasis on the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll be referencing as SDG moving forward. So as shown in the picture is, as shown in the picture is um, Blue Planet Alliance at COP27. And in one way in which they want to implement these SDGs in their action is by increasing the participation in climate-related events and also leading their own. So before last year, they attended the second high-level ocean conference in Lisbon, and they also attended COP27, in which they participated in a panel titled um, Achieving Net Zero by 2045, in which they discussed their accomplishments, their history, and also their future aspirations in climate. And also, they, they love SDG number 17, which is uh, Partnerships for the Goals, because not only is it in our name, Blue Planet Alliance, but it is also shown by the 75 MOUs, or a Memorandum of Understandings, that we have signed with numerous institutions, groups, and individuals across the globe. And so not only do they want to partner with institutions and organizations, but also with youth as a whole, and one way in doing so was establishing the Global Planet Ambassador Program, in which youth are given the opportunity and the platform in climate action. And one way in doing so was by sending me and fellow masters, Stacey Allen and Alyssa Kong, who are in the audience today, um, to Elkoi last year. And Elkoi is a local conferences of youth organized by Young Go to draft a national youth statement to be presented at COP the following year. And so it's important to note that the ambassadors aren't only based out of New York City, but we also have ambassadors in Palau and Guam. And Taka Akitaya is a Palau global ambassador who speaks about his experience in climate. And he starts off his uh, writing piece by saying how, one thing I never do is litter. Because as a world of 8 billion people, we have to know how to dispose of our trash properly and how to recycle before it's too late. And moving forward, BK has also organized multiple events during climate, during climate Week, which is where they hosted a Jeffersonian dinner to unite organizations and institutions to come by and to um, encourage each other further in climate action. We also hosted an event during World Environment Day where we invited our partnering organizations to come and just celebrate our environment. And on this day, they also hosted a youth panel in which not only New York City ambassadors um, came to talk about their experience in climate action, but ambassadors from Palau also zoomed in, such as Sean and Morgan. And also, which is a very fun event that BPA hosted, is the bike ride cleanup, bike ride and um, beach cleanup, not only in New York City at Coney Island, which if you live in New York City, you know how filthy it is, the beach can get at times. I'm being so real right now. <laughs> New York City is like very, you know, yeah, food. Um, anyways, but they also hosted um, the beach cleanup in Palau and Guam as well, as shown in the slide above. And so as I'm about to close, I wanted to like say a short segment on, how, on the importance of youth and climate action. 
As youth, we play a critical role in the fight against climate change through advocating for sustainability and protecting our ecosystems before it's too late. We implement our creativity, our knowledge, and our values in the numerous ways that we have participated in climate action, such as climate strikes where we walk out of school, or digital campaigns on social media. We know that we'll be living in this world in the future, but if governments and companies that are fueled by self-interest continue on the destructive path that they are on now, or if we continue on our consumerist wasteful ways, how can we promise a future for those after us, or a future for Earth? And so as youth, we will ensure that our voices are heard and acknowledged, and that we will take action and responsibilities to the best of our capabilities. And is this that will make and is this that will makes us such a fundamental component in climate action. Next, we have um, Ale, who, who is a New York Youth Outreach Coordinator with Reverse the Trend. Reverse the Trend works to amplify the voices of young people primarily coming in from frontline communities who have been directly affected by nuclear weapons and climate change. So I'll pass it over to you. Okay, so we're going to have <laughs> Dion speak. He was a participant of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance's Youth Summit, which took place in Panama last month. The Our Ocean Conference was an opportunity to inspire, inform, and empower youth participants to build holistic solutions that better balance the needs of society, industry, and the ocean environment. Go ahead, Dion. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in New York. I actually got here at 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> All right, so my name is Neon Marie. I am from Trinidad and Tobago. I have a master's in renewable energy with focus in bioenergy. Um, we have a problem right now in the Caribbean with sagas and seaweed. So that's my main focus in turning sagas and seaweed into biogas and fertilizer. Okay, so what we do. So during my thesis, I would have come up with this company, Mises Energy. And what we do is bioenergy research, education, and outreach, local and regional projects. This is 10, like 10, yeah. And then climate change, renewable energy, consultation, and of course, the emphasis on sagas and seaweed. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to thank SOA, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, for allowing me to attend the Our Ocean Conference through a scholarship, um, as well as special thanks to Khadija, who is not here with us today, uh, from Peace Boat, Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassador, and also the SOA Caribbean Regional Rep. Um, if I didn't do that, I would be in trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's go straight into what the Ocean Youth Summit did for me. Now, they hosted a sprint. The sprint basically was on biomimicry. Biomimicry was using some form of nature to, um, I guess, enhance the capabilities of, um, I guess, a mechanical or something to help with climate change. And my group decided to name a contraption cell neuray. Right? So the purpose of cell neuray was to reduce the nutrient runoff. Now, if I take you back to my research in sargasm seaweed, the runoff, the nutrient runoff, is kind of like one of the main reasons why we have so much sargasm um, growing. Um, so I wanted to put my mark on the project. Um, so we use the corals, like filtration system, to create a membrane. If you look to the middle, picture, you'll see a diagram which one of the architects on my team drew in like four hours, which was really good. Um, I use my renewable energy background with the tidal um, energy. You can notice the propeller in the middle of the, the um, drawing. Um, this would energize or ionize 
a membrane, which is the green, uh, I guess, it's a film kind of in the picture. And this would attract the nutrients which run off into the ocean. So it's like a reducing the amount of runoff going into the ocean to reduce the tigers and seaweed from increasing you know, growth. Right? And of course the solution, as I just said, is the stuff water pollution and seagrass uh, for the like species. So this is some pictures. Uh, we have Agua Clara to the top right, um, top left, sorry. Um, this was a visit to Panama Canal. I was so thankful for that because I don't know if I would, would have ever seen that. And while we were there, we got to see a boat pass through the canal um, with the locks open and pull them back. That, that was amazing. Um, to the right, I actually got an opportunity to speak on the panel. Thank you for that as well. Sophia is here from SOA. <laughs> And the last picture is uh, all of us at the end of the Power Ocean Conference. So to end, I'd like to have a message to the youth and our elders. My message to the youth and our elder leaders, we must work together to change the outlook on living a sustainable life. We must find a way to coexist in this scary world of greed we live in. We do not have much more time. Climate change is real. You have a voice, and these organizations give us a platform to voice our opinions and teach us the necessary skills needed to harness our ideas and bring them to life. There are people in this world willing to help, and you just have to find them. I found mine through Emily at Peace Boat, Khadija, SOA, Caribbean Rep, and Peace Boat Rep, Ambassador, Sophia. So thank you so much. Introduction, but take it away. <laughs> thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Ale Rizvi, um, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about Reverse the Trend. I'm uh, the New York Youth Coordinator for RTT, and um, I graduated from NYU in 2021, and I studied um, international relations and economics. Throughout college, I was very involved in nuclear disarmament activism, uh, specifically in the Middle East region. Um, so, what is RTT? RTT is the youth-led initiative of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Um, as you can see, uh, we seek to amplify the voices of young people, especially young people who have been personally and directly affected by nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons testing. The Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is um, a partner organization of ICANN, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our team. These are our project coordinators. Uh, Christian Chobanu, who's here with us today. Um, you heard him speak earlier. Um, he's our policy and advocacy coordinator for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Um, Danielle Sandler, who's a fellow for the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, and Lovely Omayo who is the founder and chief creative producer for Bombshell Tech, another partner organization. Slide, please. So this uh, kind of outlines uh, what RTT offers. Um, we focus a lot on education, and we've developed like a curriculum for schools to adopt. Um, we also, I think what makes us unique is um, that we embrace the interdisciplinary um, features of activism. We really um, try to uh, provide a platform for artists as well, and um, really take into account the, the creative forms of activism. Next slide, please. These are my um, these are my counterparts located around the world. They're other youth coordinators, and uh, this photo was taken at our youth program in Vienna last summer where we attended uh, the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW. Um, next slide, please. So for that um, event, we hosted a youth orientation for all the delegations of youth who attended the first meeting of states parties. Um, it was hosted at the Embassy of Ireland, and um, it was a great experience. Uh, we, we had all kinds of high-level speakers, professors, uh, diplomats, and 
just experts throughout the disarmament field. Um, this was the youth statement that was co-delivered by um, one of our members and a member of MEI, the Marshallese Education, Educational Initiative, which uh, you heard Benedict speak on behalf of earlier. Um, we, like, like I said, we tried to amplify as much as we can the voices of people who are directly affected, and Marcina, who is speaking here, um, is part of the Marshallese diaspora. You guys just heard uh, Benedict speak. Um, this was at the NPT Review Conference, um, which happened recently, and we hosted a youth orientation for that as well. So we've worked a lot on uh, the TPNW, and we've seen it throughout um, its stages of development, and uh, even before it entered into force. And we particularly focus on um, Articles 6 and 7. We try to promote that as much as possible, which uh, is about environmental remediation and um, working with uh, affected groups of people, uh, people who have been directly affected by nuclear weapons testing. Um, this photo was from um, an event titled From the Pacific to the Steps, Engaging with Frontline Communities on the TPNW with representatives from Kiribati, Kazakhstan, the ICRC, and MEI. RTT continues to expand its presence on university campuses to engage with youth. Uh, we've hosted many events in universities uh, in and around New York and also around the world. And we've established student clubs in many of these colleges. Um, these photos were from our events, our recent events at Fordham and NYU um, on the effects of nuclear weapon testing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, RTT is a youth-led initiative, and accordingly, our programs focus on engaging with youth and providing opportunities for young people to get involved, and providing them access to high-level venues. Uh, this was an event at uh, the Columbia Model UN. Um, this was in 2020. We attended the ICANN Paris Forum with a delegation of youth, where we attended seminars and lectures uh, from experts in the field. You know, as a, I was a college student myself back then, uh, interning with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. And, um, you know, it was really amazing how it provided us access to venues that, you know, I would never would have thought of encountering. And uh, it gave me access to a network of activists around the world and uh, really equipped me with, uh, you know, the skills we need to be activists. And uh, I'd say that most of the youth who attended would, would share that sentiment. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we really try to embrace the interdisciplinary um, elements of activism. Uh, a Journey Home, which you see on the left, um, is uh, a community poem written by six Marshallese students living in Springville, Arkansas. Um, in addition to the paintings by Marshallese youth uh, on the right, um, we, we worked with MEI to expose the trauma uh, experienced by Marshallese diaspora as a result of the twin threats of nuclear weapons and climate change. Last year, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, RTT, and MEI collaborated with a number of organizations to host uh, this event, Amnesia Atomica. Uh, it was a public art exposition that took place in Times Square for a week, where we uh, displayed an artist named Pedro Reyes' Zero Nukes. It was a 30-foot-long uh, inflatable structure um, of a mushroom cloud that was on display throughout the week in Times Square. So, um, RTT will be hosting an info session soon, later this month, um, on the 28th, and uh, it's here in New York. So for any youth here who are um, interested in, you know, partaking and uh, care about nuclear disarmament and climate change issues, uh, we encourage you to attend. And this is another event we're hosting uh, the following day at Columbia University. And uh, all the information for these events, uh, we have flyers on the front at the table, and uh, you can find it on our social media as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Elise with World Youth for Climate Justice. Go ahead, Elise. Thanks so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Elisa Granzotto from Italy, and I make part of World Youth for Climate Justice, which is a youth-led organization, global youth-led organization. And just to give uh, a bit more content about climate action, as we all know, climate change poses a grave threat 
to humanity as a whole and an existential threat to the most vulnerable. And human rights of people living in communities on the front line of the climate crisis are already being impacted and violated today. And since the SDG number six is uh, a little bit the start of this week, I also want to st stress how the right to clean water and sanitation is indeed one of these fundamental human rights being violated today. And WYCJ as a youth organization underlines how children are actually one of the most vulnerable group um, when we talk about the entitlement to the right of clean water. And in fact, the access to clean water do not only negatively affect um, their health, but also their nutrition, education, right, the right to housing, right to a clean environment, and every other aspect of their life. You summit that we co-hosted in Panama, we had 77 youth from 45 different countries, and it's the first time that the youth summit was fully integrated into the conference. All the youth attendees got a badge to the main conference, so they were able to be present in the plenaries and attend uh, all the sessions as well. Um, so just to share a little bit more about Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we're a youth network as well of youth from ages 18 to 35. We have over 80 hubs in more than 40 countries. So if you're youth and you're interested in ocean climate action, specifically for SDG 14, I invite you to sign up as a young ocean leader on our website. You can come find me if you have any questions about that. Um, I'm a global community manager. And just follow us on social media, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, to stay up to date with what we're doing. Uh, we also have a campaign against deep seabed mining. We have some of our staff members right now in Jamaica at the International Seabed Authority sessions, really advocating for that and trying to get more countries on board against deep seabed mining. So you can also, yes. <laughs> um, I invite you to please sign our uh, open letter petition you can find it on our website and on our social media. We have over 250,000 signatures and growing, so please add your name to that. And I have here Amelia, who is our hub leader for SOA New York City, and she can share a little bit more of an example of what hubs do and how they activate. So, Amelia. Awesome, yeah, hi, I'm Amelia. Um, I am the director of our New York City SOA hub. We are a semi-newer hub. We founded our, you know, little center of SOA over the pandemic. Um, so we were kind of scattered all over the world. We were doing mostly virtual events at that time, obviously. Uh, we've had a lot of success doing beach cleanups in Manhattan, but we've also done things that have been really exciting, like hosting panels with experts in the entertainment field on ecotainment. How do you discuss climate change with little kids? How do you discuss it with adults? Uh, we've also done like a sustainable art show in collaboration with a bunch of artists across the city. And we're currently in the process of planning an ocean-based themed hackathon, uh, which is going to be a long-term process, but that's what we're in the middle of right now. Um, our hub is particularly interested in the intersection of human health and ocean health, particularly since we're founded and based in New York City. Um, the oceans, I think, feel quite distant sometimes to people who live in New York City, even though we're right on an ocean, but I think we feel a little bit trapped in our metropolis. So if you have any questions about deep sea bed mining and the impacts on human health, please come talk to me. I can talk about that all day. And yeah, thank you everyone so much for being here and Sophia and Emily and everyone.